Uh, good morning and welcome everybody. Um, today is the first meeting of the UMBC Cyber Defense Lab for the fall 2023 series. We will be meeting approximately every two weeks, uh, Fridays, usually 12 to 1 and a few times 1 to 2. So check the uh, schedule carefully. Um, in each meeting, typically we'll have um, someone either from UMBC or outside speak about ongoing um, interesting research in cybersecurity. I'm Alan Sherman, Professor of Computer Science and Director of the uh, UMBC Cyber Defense Lab. Uh, things are looking very upbeat for cybersecurity at UMBC. Um, the state of Maryland has just uh, given $3 million to the UMBC budget each year in perpetuity to advance cybersecurity. So we'll be making uh, several hires over the next few years. Uh, we also have SFS scholarships for students at the BS, MS, PhD level who want to uh, work for government um, after their degrees in cybersecurity. Um, we have a rolling admission. So if you're interested in those scholarships for US citizens and permanent residents, um, please talk to me and you can apply via UMBC a scholarship re retriever. There's more information on the UMBC site for the Center for Cybersecurity. Uh, today is our uh, honor and privilege to have uh, Dr. Jeremy Clark. He's an associate professor at Concordia University. Uh, we're colleagues who've worked for many years on voting projects, including um, Scantegrity and uh, Vodex. Um, Dr. Clark is also an expert on um, blockchain and electronic currency and and today he's going to be talking about uh, fast uh, withdrawals um, involving blockchains so uh, welcome great uh, thanks Alan and it's nice to be back uh, virtually uh, with you guys at UMBC um, so I uh, gave this talk uh, earlier at another place A16Z uh, crypto and I had a couple slides about the research that I do just background and I thought I might just leave them in anyways and, and, and go through them. Uh, so before we get to the main topic, uh, if anything piques your interest, uh, I'm very open to talking. You can shoot me an email. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear from you guys uh, about this thing. Or if you have questions about any of these at the end of the talk, you can also ask. Um, so as Alan mentioned, you know, we, we've worked for a long time, over 10 years on uh, cryptographic voting, how to add cryptographic verifiability to voting systems so you know with confidence that your vote counted, but you're not able to prove to someone else how you voted. Uh, another thing we look at is, is lots of stuff on blockchain. Uh, and so I sort of broke it into a couple subcategories. So one thing we do is we like to build things on top of uh, blockchains. And another thing we look at are, are more of the protocols that, that involve uh, blockchain. So, so one thing is uh, proof of solvency, uh, which is very similar to a voting system, actually cryptographically. And the idea is that if you have an exchange and it's sitting, like think of Quadricex, uh, FTX, which recently collapsed. There was an earlier one called Mt. Gox. Uh, you may have heard of these uh, from the news. Um, they basically, they, they got hacked or there was fraud uh, within the, the company. And all the Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that they were supposedly holding on behalf of their customers was gone. And so the idea of a proof of solvency is could, could the exchange actually prove cryptographically that they control enough cryptocurrency to settle each user's account? And so users would log in, they would get a piece of the proof where they could check that their balance is, is being correctly reflected. Uh, and then you could... Uh, do kind of like a proof that you know the keys, the signing keys for all the assets that you supposedly own, and then you kind of add it all up under encryption and, and, and subtract it out, and you should your assets should be greater uh, than your liabilities. So this is something that that we did a paper quite a few years ago, uh, but it never really caught on. Exchanges they liked the idea, but they didn't feel like there was a need to do it. And so they, you know, it just wasn't a priority, I would say, for exchanges. But since the FTX collapse, there's been a lot of renewed interest in this. Uh, one thing I'm interested in is standardization 
uh, a proof of solvency so that that all exchanges could could do it the same way uh, because there's a bunch of ones that that exchanges have kind of rolled their own protocols and and they don't actually work. Uh, there's different attacks and things like that. Uh, other things we do in our lab is we we do a lot of what are called SOK papers or systemization of knowledge papers. So we try to um, take an area of research where there there's a lot of knowledge out there, but it's kind of spread out. It might not be in the academic community, it might be on blog posts and forums and things like that. And so we try and put it together. So we, we've done a whole bunch uh, in the blockchain space and we've done some in other areas like HTTPS and in encrypted email. Uh, I, I love uh, anything to do with time and cryptography. I, I don't know why, I, I just always found that really interesting. And it's why I got into Bitcoin in the first place uh, was the, the way that it used proof of work as a, a kind of delay function in addition to doing other types of things. Um, and so we, we have a, a bunch of papers in this area. Uh, one of the more recent ones is on uh, short-lived zero-knowledge proofs and signatures where you can give someone a zero-knowledge proof or you can sign a document. It's valid for whatever you want to parameterize it for. So let's say you set it for an hour. And then after an hour, you can't tell whether the signature is, is valid or not. And there's no follow-up action needed. So it's not like you, you reveal a key or something like that. It's just like you sign it, you send it. You could disappear before the hour is up, uh, but it still will sort of naturally expire uh, in, in, whatever, in an hour or whatever time you send it for. Uh, my most recent interest is in central bank digital currency. So this would be a, a sort of cryptocurrency uh, that would be issued by, say, the U.S. Fed. Uh, it would represent a government dollar. It would just be digital. It wouldn't necessarily have to be blockchain based or I, I said a cryptocurrency, but it can also be, um, you know, more of a traditional da database that's set up by the central bank or other entities. There's a lot of different ways of doing it. And the big question, the big debate is around privacy. So should this be anonymous like, like dollars uh, or should it be traceable like your current banking system uh, or should it be some sort of balance or should you use some fancy cryptography to try and achieve both? And so these, these are really interesting questions. And I think it's a really good time to look at these questions now because there's a lot of interest in CBDCs. And most of the people that are working in this space just completely punt on the privacy issue. They they acknowledge that it's an issue to get sorted out. So they 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 know it's important, but they just they don't have solutions uh, to it. And then we do some fun research as well. So this is one uh, where we read 400 papers from a, a, a top security conference called Using Security, and we looked at how they were written. So it was about the writing of the paper and the proxy we use for how it was written is we just looked at the first sentence of every single paper and we looked at and see, you know, how, how is it that an author starts a paper? Um, you know, and, and, and so you can see like different categorizations. So some of them might just start with a definition. Uh, some of them might draw you in like with a narrative or ask a question. A lot of them will try and argue like, oh, my paper's important uh, because it's, you know, it's about something that everyone uses or it's something that's really important or it's something that uh, has been around for 30 years, you know. And so, so anyway, there, there's definitely patterns uh, to it. Uh, and so this this is uh, a fun thing. There's there's a blog post as well. If the paper's too boring, uh, you can just sort of Google opening sentences security and it, it will come up. Okay, so that's uh, some of the stuff uh, that we work on. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, our newest paper. This will appear at uh, Advances in Financial Technology, which is a newer conference that's trying to be uh, like a main venue for blockchain uh, papers, AFT. Um, and the topic I know is a little bit niche uh, for this audience because I'm assuming that you're sort of general security crypto people and you're not necessarily in the weeds on all things blockchain. And this is about, you know, a subtopic of a subtopic topic of a subtopic uh, within blockchain. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually spend more time maybe on the background. So I'll, I'll try and tell you like what's an optimistic roll up, what problem is it solving? Uh, you know, how are we trying to scale blockchains today? And then I'll, I'll spend a bit of time on our exact contribution, but I'm hoping that that you walk away from the talk just with sort of a better, better understanding of sort of 
what are the efficiency issues with blockchain and, and how are people trying to solve them? Okay, so this is a uh, joint work. Uh, so the first author is Masa Musevi, who's on the call, I believe, uh, and she's my PhD student at Concordia. She also works full time as an engineer uh, for off chain labs. Uh, off chain labs create uh, created Arbitrum, uh, which is a very popular what's called a layer two, and I'll go through what that means uh, for the Ethereum uh, blockchain. Uh, you might also know it as Ed Felton's company. Uh, so Ed Felton was a professor at Princeton for a long time and, and wrote lots of papers in, in this in security. Uh, uh, we also have uh, Mehdi Salehi, who is my uh, master's student, now graduated, also an engineer uh, with Offchain Labs. Daniel Goldman, also an engineer at Offchain Labs, and myself. Okay, so let's start with sort of thinking about scalability of how blockchains work. And, and um, you probably have heard that there's sort of scalability issues uh, with blockchain, but you might not know, uh, you know, is this just need more engineering or, or like what's the nature of the problem? Um, so we can contrast it with cloud computing. So cloud computing kind of looks the same as a blockchain. There's a whole bunch of nodes out there and they're there to do computations on your behalf. Okay, so that's the same, same architecture as a blockchain. Uh, what happens in cloud computing is, you know, the, the service provider will figure out, oh, here's a node that's close to you or has capacity uh, to, to run your computation. And so you ask it to run something and it will return you the result. And that's fine. So it, it tries to optimize it and tries to give it to you as, as quickly as possible. Blockchains work a little different. So they start kind of the same way uh, where you say, I have a computation, I want it run. You kind of broadcast it to all of these nodes on the network. But the difference with blockchain is that every single node executes your method for you. Okay. So instead of one node doing it, the closest one, uh, in this case, every single node is going to do it. Then they're going to do a sort of voting process called consensus. And they're all going to agree, oh, like Z is the right uh, output value uh, for this particular thing. Um, and it tolerates, you know, malicious nodes and, and, and things like that. Uh, and not only will every node execute every transaction, but even future nodes, when they join the network, they have to go through the history of every past transaction in order to figure out what the current state of the system is. So every future node that will ever join Ethereum, for example, uh, is going to run your method as well. Okay. So, uh, so your method is being looked at by, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, maybe in, including all future nodes, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of, of different servers. Um, and so this is kind of crazy. Uh, if you want efficiency and scalability, this seems like the worst idea in the world. Okay. But what it's really good on is integrity. So you're really certain because thousands of people have all agreed uh, with some tolerance uh, that Z is the output of your method. You're really, really sure that this is the right output. Okay. You're so sure that you can do million, 10 million, $100 million transactions, and you don't have to worry about the servers uh, trying to, to, to produce the wrong results uh, because it benefits them and they could have an opportunity to steal your money or something like that. Okay, so anyway, so blockchain is high integrity, but really low uh, efficiency. And so for some applications that makes sense, other applications you want efficiency and so cloud computing makes sense. So there's, I think, room for both of these uh, kinds of solutions based on what you want to do. All right, so we want to improve the efficiency of blockchain. And so basically we want to try and solve this idea that every node is going to run every method ever uh but we ideally don't want to compromise too much on those integrity we still want that high integrity property of, of lots of nodes have looked at it and they've all agreed on what the output is so what can we do so the answer is there's a couple things and all of these are sort of being pursued uh uh by different people okay so uh, the first thing is called sharding. So sharding is basically you split your network into what are called shards or, or subsets of your network. And instead of the entire network looking at it, just one subnet looks at the transaction. Uh, it can work a little faster because you only have to propagate it within uh, that sub 
that sub subsection of your network. Uh, I'll call it a subnet. That's a sort of term that's used by another uh, solution called Avalanche. Um, and uh, the the problem with it is that the subnet only keeps track of everything, all the methods that it's looking at. It doesn't it doesn't try and track what's going on uh, outside of it. And so sometimes you have transactions that touch, like say you're you're moving from one account to another. One shard is in charge of one account. The other shard is in charge of the other account. Now you have to like go across shards in order to complete that transaction. Um, and so every now and then there's sort of a synchronization uh, kind of uh, step where all the shards sort of talk to each other and they try and sync up on all the things that they're not paying active attention to. So anyway, this is this is a whole thing. Um, Ethereum is in some state of, of uh, standardizing how they would like to do this and it will roll out sometime in the future. Okay, another idea is uh, what if instead of uh, having every node execute every transaction, you give your transaction to one node, that node figures out what the result is, and they want to convince all the other nodes of what the result is without the other nodes actually running the transaction. What they could do is they could issue a proof that this is the correct output for this particular method. Okay. Now, if now all the other nodes will still have to check the proof. Okay. So th the first question you have is well, is checking the proof that the output is correct actually faster than just executing it yourself and seeing if the output is correct? And so the answer is yes, for, for, for a large number of, of um, transactions, they become complex enough that verifying a proof is actually faster. And the proofing, the proof technology has also become very good, uh, where you can take arbitrarily complex things, you can issue a proof for it, and basically the proof is constant size, constant time uh, for verifiers to verify it. So this is called snarks if you've uh, paid paid attention to that space, or it's also known as verifiable computing is is it's part of that paradigm. Okay, um, so so this this works. Now the problem with it is that uh, the generating the proof is way more work than executing the transaction, generally speaking, for these snark systems. Okay, so. What the purple node is doing is they're doing 10, 100 times the amount of work that they would normally do of just executing the transaction because they also have to generate a proof. But then all the blue nodes, they're doing way less work because they're just verifying a proof rather than re-executing uh, the method itself, okay? So you have to decide if that trade-off's worth it. You have to sort of amortize that cost across the whole network and see whether, um, whether at the end of the day, you're actually saving uh, if it's, it's if you're saving, and so you could imagine that if the proof generation was relatively fast, and you had a whole lot of blue nodes, right, like way more blue nodes than purple nodes, right, then then the economics start to make sense, and you could see that that you could save uh, time and efficiency and computation uh, using this kind of approach. Okay, now you won't generate a proof for every transaction. What you'll do is you'll take a bundle of transactions, or kind of like a block. Uh, and then you'll generate a proof that this entire block is is correct, and this is the the state update of the entire state of the world on the blockchain uh, for for that particular block of transactions. So that idea of of sort of doing a whole bunch of transactions at once is called a roll up. Um, so these technologies are called roll ups, uh, and then this flavor of a roll up is called a zk roll up because it uses the technology that that originally came from ZK snarks, uh, which are zero knowledge snarks. And there is actually no zero knowledge in a ZK rollup because everyone, these methods are public, they're, they're broadcast on the network for everyone to see. So it's kind of a misnomer to call it a ZK rollup, but, but anyways, that's, that's where we are. Okay, then the final way of doing it uh, is called an optimistic rollup. And this is the space that we're interested in. Um, so optimistic rollups work kind of the same way as a zero as a zk rollup, where you pick one node, one node executes it, and it reports on what the output is. But instead of using cryptography and issuing a zero knowledge proof, what they're going to do instead is they're going to use sort of economics. So they're going to put a bunch of money uh, behind their assertion that this is correct. So they're going to say, "I executed it. This is the result I have. I'm going to post a bounty." Uh, that says it's correct, 
And if you can show that it's not correct, then you can keep my money, the money that I'm staking on this being correct. Okay. So what all the other nodes will do is they'll still verify uh, that uh, it looks correct. Uh, and what they'll do is if, if they like it, uh, if they like what they see, uh, then they'll, they'll just let it go. And, and, so, and so it will uh, finalize. And if they don't like what they see, uh, then what they can do is they can dispute it. Okay. So they can file a dispute that says, oh, this Z value is not correct. Uh, the Z value uh, will, um, so, so then the question is, okay, now you have two people saying two different things, right? So who adjudicates that? And the answer is we go back to normal Ethereum. Uh, so we go all the way back to just running it as, as we traditionally would on Ethereum with all the validators trying to uh, settle this dispute. But what optimistic rollups do, the main technical innovation, is they get the two people who are in dispute about what the output is to narrow down exactly where the dispute happens. So think of a computation as a series of steps. So what they'll say is, well, we both agree on the first million steps of this computation and on the millionth and one step, that's like where we get different results. And then what Ethereum will do is it won't, it won't re-execute everything. It will just go to that one step. It will re-execute that one step and then it will say who's right and, and who's wrong. Okay. And so that, that idea gives you uh, these cheap on-chain disputes where, where you can, you can uh, use Ethereum to, to, to adjudicate. Okay, so this idea comes from a Usenix security paper uh, called Arbitrum. Uh, Arbitrum then became a, a company, well, Offchain Labs is the company that makes it and Arbitrum is the product. Arbitrum today is, is um, one of the most, it's the most successful efficiency, uh, we call them layer twos, anything that, that sort of uh, tries to take transactions off of Ethereum, which would be the layer one uh, blockchain and execute in its own environment. Uh, they're, they're called layer twos. And so you can see that uh, this, this is a couple months old, but Arbitrum has 60% of the market share. Uh, the second biggest is called Optimism. It's also this optimistic roll-up technology. It has 22% of the market share. And then the first ZK roll-up uh, has only 6%. Okay, so this optimistic roll-up technology is sort of be more widely adopted. And then uh, not so long ago, the number of transactions on Arbitrum are actually more than the number of transactions on Ethereum. So more people are, are using Arbitrum than, than sending them directly uh, to Ethereum. Okay, so this is very successful technology. It's a mainstream technology in the blockchain space. It's not some, you know, uh, obscure academic project uh, kind of thing. This is something that, that that lots of people are using every day, and there's billions of dollars that are are sitting on the system and being protected uh, by this technology. Okay, so we can think of uh, how do you know whether a transaction output is correct? We can think of the different ways. Um, so the de facto in blockchain is I believe it because I ran it myself. Okay, uh, an alternative is I I might believe it because lots of other people tell me it's true and enough of them, I trust them. Uh, so this is like proof of authority. Um, there's a, a fancy way of doing it where uh, basically people put a lot of work into extending the idea that it's true. That probably doesn't mean anything to you uh, unless if you've studied uh, blockchain uh, like in detail, but there's a protocol in Bitcoin uh, that was in the original uh, white paper from Satoshi Nakamoto uh, called Simplified Payment Verification or SPV. So that's that's the idea of it, uh, which is that no one would waste the effort in extending a chain if it weren't correct. Uh, there's the, I believe it because I have a mathematical proof that it's correct and I checked the proof. So that would be a ZK roll up. And then I believe it because someone put a lot of money or staked a lot of money on it being correct. Uh, so that's the idea of an optimistic roll up. Okay, now optimistic rollups, uh, they're, they're, they're actually kind of a, a hybrid between five and two. Uh, there, there is still a kind of allow list of who's allowed to validate and things like that. This is changing. Um, so the, Arbitrum have announced the next stage of, of Arbitrum, uh, which, which will eliminate um, this idea that, that it will basically make the whole thing permissionless. So anyone can do anything that they want uh, in practice with it. Um, 
And uh, they're optimistic because if everything goes right and everyone reports only right results, then you don't have to do anything else. But in the pessimistic case where somebody is pushing state updates that are incorrect, then you have to dispute it and then you need a mechanism to resolve disputes. And so the mechanism you use to resolve disputes would be something like one to four, okay? Um, so, so you still need those, uh, those things don't go away, they just become the backup, they become the pessimistic way of, of doing it. So uh, in Arbitrum specifically, um, uh, it would be sort of a blend of two and five in the optimistic path and in the pessimistic path, it would be one. Uh, yeah, and so, so you, uh, obviously, you, in order to dispute something, you could also dispute as a kind of denial of service. So you could just dispute everything uh, that goes by. And so the disputer also has to stake money. So the person making the assertion is, uh, uh, stakes money, the person disputing it also stakes money, and then uh, our Ethereum will adjudicate it. And then the winner, like the, the right person will take both, both of that money, okay? So, um, so it's costly. To dispute, so that sort of solves that kind of denial of, of service vector, um, and then the idea uh, of Arbitrum, the main idea was to to narrow the disputes to a single opcode or, or something really really small, so Ethereum doesn't have to check the entire transaction; uh, they just can just check one step in the execution, that first step where where people depart, and a dispute might involve, you know, forks in execution on multiple points, and so there there's all sorts of stuff that gets kind of complicated for for dealing with that but the the, the system has like a lot of uh details that i'm sort of glossing over okay so how does an optimistic roll-up kind of look in practice so we know that we have these people that are executing the transactions and they're 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 staking stuff on they're not they're not ethereum servers they're some other servers right but they talk to ethereum and we know that Ethereum can get involved in disputes and things like that. So, so like exact, like who is where and how does this whole thing work? How's, what's the whole architecture look like? Okay, so what you start with, if you wanna do an optimistic rollup, uh, what you start with is you put two contracts on the layer one version, which is Ethereum, okay? One's called an inbox and one's called the X outbox. And th these are only for executing transactions, okay? The other thing you might wanna do is you might have assets uh, that are sitting on layer one and you wanna move them to layer two. Uh, so then we have another contract called a bridge. So uh, inbox outbox box are for executing transactions. The bridge is for moving assets uh, between the layers. And in our research paper, we, we touched the outbox and the bridge, um, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. Okay, so this is how Arbitrum or any optimistic rollup uh, would work. So uh, I have a transaction, uh, I want it um, run. So what I'll do is I'll actually submit it to layer one first, okay? But instead of uh, having asking layer one to execute it, I'm gonna ask layer one only to record it. So what layer one is gonna do is they're gonna write down the transaction that I want run what's the name of the function I want run on what contract address and what are the parameters. So they'll, they'll write that down, but it won't actually execute it. Okay, so that's what the inbox the contract does. It just collects, it's kind of like a bulletin board for transactions that people want run on the layer two. Um, and there's fancy things you can do if you know Ethereum about trying to make this memory efficient and things like that, like storing it in call data, but those details don't matter so much. Now, there, there, there's also this other debate uh, around this, this entity called a sequencer. Uh, in our protocol, we don't care at all about sequencers, but the, the way Arbitrum actually works in practice is you don't, generally speaking, don't submit directly to the inbox yourself. What you do is you send the transaction that you want executed actually just through the web. You don't send it, you don't connect to Ethereum. You just send it to a server. The server is called a sequencer. They take a whole bunch of these transactions, they kind of pack them together, and then they pay the gas to, 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 to store that in the inbox contract. So they're the ones that actually run that execution. Sorry, that, that actually execute the transaction, which is a request to store all the transactions that you want run 
Um, and then the sequencer can also do things in terms of how you order transaction that's related to front running attacks, which is what I talked about uh, last time I talked here. But anyways, sequencers are kind of controversial and the fact that it's a single entity that runs a sequencer, some people don't like and decentralizing sequencers is a big research area. And so anyway, so that's that's this that's where this whole sequencer thing comes in, just in case you've heard about it. Uh, but for the purposes of today, we're just going to forget the sequencer. We're going to assume that users just submit their transactions directly uh, to the inbox. The inbox contract records it. Then what happens is off chain, you have a bunch of servers. Uh, that are part of the Arbitrum network. And what they'll do is they'll periodically go to the inbox. They'll pull the latest transactions out of the inbox. They'll execute those transactions. They'll figure out what's the output of those transactions. How does it change the state of all the things that are running on Arbitrum? So all the things running on Arbitrum is called ARB OS. It's kind of like an operating system. You think of it as a virtual machine. Ethereum calls it an EVM. Uh, Ethereum virtual machine, but it's basically like every contract, every parameter variable, every state variable in every contract and what the current value of that is. Uh, so it's kind of like a computer or whatever, but you can just think of it as uh, the history of all transactions or how, however you want to, whatever mental model you want to use. It's the state of the world on, on Arbitrum. Okay. So what it will do is it will say, okay, this is as a result of executing this batch of transactions, uh, this is what the new state of Arbitrum looks like, and then they'll push that as a block uh, called an R block, and they push it to the outbox back to Ethereum. So what Ethereum has is they have a set of every transaction that, that runs. Okay, you won't run anything that's not in the inbox. You'll run it in exactly the order that it's recorded in the inbox. And then they have what the resulting output should be. Okay, so the only thing Ethereum doesn't have is they didn't actually, they didn't actually execute it, okay? But they have everything they need to resolve the dispute. They know what the inputs are. They know what the outputs are. So there's a record of everything. They're just not doing the actual execution. Okay, so that's important uh, because if you want to resolve, um, if you want to resolve disputes, Ethereum has to has to know, you know, what sort of what it's adjudicating. Okay, so what zk rollups would do is they would just push that state update with a zero knowledge proof. The outbox would verify the proof. And then it would post, it would only accept it if the proof is valid. And then now it's valid. Okay. What uh, optimistic rollups do instead is you push the R block into the outbox. You push the money that you're staking or you've already staked it. Um, and then now what you're going to do is you have to wait a certain period of time so that if someone checks your R block and decides that it's wrong, they have an opportunity to dispute it. Okay, so we call this the the, the dispute window, or uh, because it becomes a problem when you try to with, withdraw assets, it's also called the withdrawal window. Okay, so currently in Arbitrum, the dispute window is seven days. Uh, optimism, it's the same, and seven's kind of like a vague number. Everyone kind of agrees that it has to be on the order of days as opposed to hours or minutes. But like, if it were six days, would the whole thing break? Probably not. Okay, so it's just sort of a a, a kind of nice round number um but it but the point is it's it's going to be a substantial amount of time okay once the seven days are over no one has disputed it then it considers it a final r block so it says that this is real this actually happened and any consequences to it of having are now finalized okay and we'll talk about what one of those consequences might be Okay, so forget about transactions now, and let's think about uh, assets. So you have a bunch of assets on layer one, and an asset is like, like it's basically just a big spreadsheet of, so it could be ETH itself, which is the, the Ethereum uh, currency. It could be all these tokens that you, you hear about uh, as well, uh, and they usually follow a standard called an ERC-20. Um, and tokens are just a spreadsheet where it just has a bunch of addresses and it has a bunch of amounts. And that's if you want to move your tokens from one person to another, you just update the spreadsheet and say, okay, now take 10 off my balance and, and give 10 to Alan or, or whatever. Okay. So tokens aren't like fancy. They're, they're not actually like things that move around. It's basically just an accounting uh, system that exists. Okay. So Arbitrum OS or ArbOS, it 
is its own isolated state. So Ethereum, because Ethereum's not checking everything that's happening on Arbitrum, uh, it doesn't really know what's happening on Arbitrum. So you could think of it as kind of like a sandbox blockchain. So Ethereum is your L1 sandbox, and then Arbitrum is your L2 sandbox. And uh, if you want a token that you have on Ethereum to show up in Arbitrum, you have to do something explicit to, to move it across. Okay. So the technology that moves it across is called a bridge. And this is how the bridge works. So you start with, say, you go to the inbox and say, I have 10 ETH. I want to deposit it on our OS. And the inbox says, okay, that's fine. Um, what we'll do is um, we're going to create 10 ETH on layer two. Okay. Uh, we're going to assign it to your account. And we're just going to mint it out of thin air. Okay. So we're just going to mint it. Uh, we'll create it. We're going to put it in your account. We're going to push a state update that says that you now have 10 ETH on layer two. Okay. And on layer one, we're going to take the 10 ETH that you gave us and we're going to lock it up in this bridge. Okay. So the bridge is kind of, so it's no longer your 10 ETH. So you, you lose your 10 ETH on layer one because the bridge takes possession of it, but you gain uh, uh, 10 ETH on layer two because the system mints new uh, ETH for you. Okay. And so the bridge will just lock it up kind of like a bank account. It's not assigned to you. It's not your 10 ETH anymore. It's just the bridges or it's the system. And all the tokens in the bridge should match exactly all the tokens that were created on layer two. So for everything that was created on layer two, there should be exactly one token in the bridge contract on layer one. So the economics should be one to one. Okay. And so what that allows you to do is it allows you to also go backwards. So you can do a withdrawal. So the way a withdrawal would work is you would come up and say, okay, I want my 10 ETH back. Uh, you would drop that in the inbox. Arbitrum would pull it off. They would execute the fact that you want to withdraw it. They would check and make sure that you actually have 10 ETH and things like that. Um, and I, I should note that you can, the, this stuff can move around. So like if I deposit the ETH in ARB, I can give it to Alan and then Alan can withdraw. Okay. So it's not, it's not tied to me. It's just when I ask to withdraw, that's when it checks to see whether I have the money to, to withdraw. It doesn't matter whether I was the one to deposit it or someone else. Okay. So it says, okay, great. I see that you have 10 ETH on layer two. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to burn it on layer two. Okay. So just zero it out. So that that disappears on layer two. And I'm going to push back to layer one, this idea that, that this withdrawal was successful and I burned it on layer two. And uh, you should be able to now walk up to the bridge and say, give me layer one tokens back out, okay? The problem is that the bridge doesn't know whether this was successful or not on layer two until the R block is finalized. The R block isn't finalized for seven days. And so the end result is you can't withdraw for seven days, okay? So you wait seven days for the R block to be final. Once it's final, then what you can do is you can walk up and say, hey, you know, this R block that you just finalized, inside of it, there was my withdrawal request, or it's called, we call it an exit. So my exit's inside of it. And now I, I want that money back. Okay. And so the outbox will say, oh yeah, this R block is actually final of seven days past. No one disputed it. So then it will go to the bridge and say, give, give them their tokens. They're good to go. And then the bridge will actually release uh, the 10 layer one ETH uh, to, to the user. Okay. So it's anyways, it's, it's kind of a, a complex uh, process, but the main thing I want to hit on is the idea that uh, that you have to wait seven days, okay? This process cannot complete until that R block is final and the R block can't be finalized uh, until the, you've had time for people to actually file dispute if, if they want to, okay? Um, this also, I, I illustrated it with ETH, but it works for any token, uh, ERC-20, other standards as well, but that's the most common one. Okay. So this goes to our research problem now. So our, our research question is, can we do something about having to wait seven days uh, to withdraw? And it's a real thing. As I said, Arbitrum is real. There's a lot of money on it. There's a lot of users that withdraw their tokens and they're surprised 
when it when it's like, oh, by the way, you have to wait seven days, right? They, they don't understand what, why do I have to wait seven days? Okay. Um, so, okay, so withdrawals take seven days. They could even take longer. So once disputes are filed, then the deadlines kind of shift in order to allow adjudication of, of, of the dispute. So it could even be longer than seven days, but no one's ever disputed anything ever. So we've always been on the optimistic path. Um, you could say, well, let's shorten seven days, you know, make it seven minutes or seven hours, but then there's other things that start to break. Uh, so for example, if someone's trying to, to, to dispute something, uh, they need to get their dispute heard by the network on time before the deadline. And so you could try to do a kind of denial of service or censorship attack on it and censorship is possible. So I talked about that also with front running because it's censorship is kind of a, a one way to censor transactions is through front running. Um, but you, and I actually gave an example where someone did a, a censorship attack. Uh, they did it for about three minutes. Uh, and they were successful and they, they, they got a bunch of money, uh, hacking this game called FOMO 3D. Um, uh, so, so anyways, we know that you can censor. And then the question is, well, what's a good window of time to make sure that no censorship can happen. So we know for a fact it can happen within 3 days. If there's a million dollars at stake, Arbitrum has. Uh, you know, 4 billion dollars at stake. So that's a thousand times more. Right? So would someone be willing to pay? you know, to, to turn that three minutes into something that's a thousand times more or even more. So we don't know exactly where that is, but we, we know that it's, you know, it should be probably on the order of days just to be sure. Okay. So let's say that, uh, um, this is sort of a philosophical point. Um, but it's an interesting one. Let's say that I'm just on Ethereum as normal and I send a transaction. Let's say I buy a coffee. Okay, so I send that Ethereum transaction and it goes to the network and everyone can see that it's a pending transaction. Okay, the question is, how certain are, if you're the owner of the coffee shop, how certain are you that that transaction will eventually finalize? Okay, and the answer is that you shouldn't be that certain because what I could do is at the same time, I could broadcast what's called a double spend, a second transaction that spends the same money in a different way. Okay. And maybe that one will get finalized instead of the one that I sent, you know, to pay for my coffee. Okay. So nothing is final until it's in the blockchain. There's a couple blocks that have been added onto the end of where that transaction is in the blockchain. Okay. So generally you, you see, like, for example, in Bitcoin, we wait, uh, six blocks, uh, six conf as it's called, uh, in order to, to think that this is actually really final, there's no chance that it's going to get, uh, reorganized away. Okay. Now what's strange about, uh, uh, optimistic rollups is you might think the same thing. So you might say, well, my transaction just landed in the inbox. What's the probability that it will actually come out the other end in an R block and that R block will be finalized. And so you might say, well. You know, it depends on the miners and, and things like that. It actually doesn't. So once it's in the inbox, it's 100% deterministic. Okay. The, the R block will, if you believe in the system and you believe that the system will eliminate any bad R blocks and only the true R block will be uh, pushed into the system, then once it's in the inbox, it's fixed. Okay. The order of the transactions are fixed. And so there, there's nothing that can upset it or anything like that. So once something's in the inbox, you can actually be, you know, a hundred percent certain that eventually that transaction will become finalized. If you're checking all the transactions in the inbox. Okay. So this is called eventual finality and it's kind of the property that we use to try and speed up. Uh, withdrawals. Okay. So it, put it another way is once your withdrawal request is in the inbox, everyone knows that you're eventually going to get the money out. Okay. It's just, you're just kind of, it's a formality that you have to wait, you know, for, for, for the seven days in, in order to do it. Okay. So the idea is at a high level, uh, if everyone knows, not everyone, but everyone that's running a validator on Arbitrum, if they all know for certain that this money is coming out in seven days, maybe they'll buy it off of me. So maybe I have 10 ETH, I've recorded it as a withdrawal, and in seven days it's going to come out. Uh, the person I'm selling it to believes that it's going to come out because they're checking all the Arbitrum transactions and it's deterministic. Uh, so maybe I could trade them for ETH that's already on layer one. 
uh, that that's not locked up in this withdraw process. Okay. And I'll probably get less. Like if I have a hundred ETH, I might only get 99 ETH from them because they're going to take a fee because they're locking their money up for seven days. And there's maybe some like remote risk that, that the R block would never finalize or something like that. So they're, they're taking on a bit of risk, uh, and they're foregoing the ability to use the ETH. So they're going to, they're going to take it at a discount, but at the same side, I could, I could trade it. Okay. So then what withdrawals look like in this paradigm is I do the withdrawal the normal way. And as soon as I have that exit, then I go to the market and I trade it for ETH. And so end to end, it's kind of like getting a withdraw, uh, from, from, from the roll up within, you know, minutes, uh, as opposed to, to waiting seven days. Okay. Uh, there's other ways of, of sort of moving money from layer twos to layer ones. Um, and so the, there, in our paper, we have a whole uh, set of them. Uh, and so some of them, we, we kind of look at them along a couple dimensions. So we, we ask the question of whether they're actually decentralized or, or not with decentralized being the preference. Uh, a fast withdrawal is basically anything faster than seven days. Uh, but we do kind of break it up in a, a kind of finer grained uh, uh, um, uh, divisions. Uh, there's one alternative that's pretty popular called atomic swaps. Uh, it kind of has some bugs uh, in terms of, of how it works. And so there's some some adverse properties that you normally don't want. I'd have to go through really into the weeds to explain what these properties are. But generally speaking, our, our uh, solution doesn't have these. Um, the nice thing about our solution is that, uh, you know, once you issue the withdrawal request, you can always use our solution. A lot of the other ones, it's up to the user to know that the seven day window is coming and for them to choose to use an alternative whether, rather than to withdraw. And once they withdraw, then they're stuck. Then they have to wait the seven days. Okay. So if you withdraw and you don't know about the seven day window, and then I tell you, oh, by the way, you have to wait seven days and you're like, no, that doesn't work for me. What can I do? We have a solution for that, whereas whereas the other ones don't. Um, and then, you know, I, I I joke that that I don't like charts that have a dot where you give yourself all the dots and and you you know because usually in real life there's always trade offs with things. So um, one thing that that a lot of these other solutions can do is they can work between arbitrary, not just layer one and layer twos. They could work between any two chains, uh, and. Whereas our system is very specific to optimistic rollups and only works for optimistic rollups. You don't really have the problem in the first place with ZK rollups, but it doesn't work with sharding or, or work with anything else. It's, it's only for uh, optimistic rollups. Okay, so the idea is that uh, I exit, I have to wait seven days. And so what the contract is going to give you is it's going to give you today uh, a claim for that uh, that uh, ETH that will be coming out in seven days if, if everything goes right. We call that ETH XX. So ETH L2 is the ETH that was on layer two that you're withdrawing. ETH L1 is what you want. So that's Ethereum that's on layer one today. It's not locked up. And then ETH XX is sort of in the intermediary stage where it's uh, it's on L1, but it's locked up and you won't get it for seven days. Okay, and so the idea of a tradable exit is just that you would uh, find someone that's willing to buy your ETH XX with ETH L1. Okay, and this seems reasonable uh, because there's lots of people that can, because of that eventual finality property, you can be sure that, you, that you're actually going to get paid. Okay, the problem is who, who's this person that's buying it from you? Okay, this person, they have to be running a validator uh, in order to, to know for sure, certain that they're going to get their money in seven days. Another question you might have is how much should you pay? Uh, so, so, or how much should you accept? If you have layer one ETH, someone's offering you ETH XX, even if you're certain that it's going to eventually uh, finalize, you still are foregoing, you, you, you're still taking locked up money for, for free money, right? And so you, you should charge something for it. So how much would you charge for it? Um, and then can you actually implement all this infrastructure and things like that and, and does it actually work? Okay, so what we do is we solve the, the, the idea of, we try to open up the number of people that would be willing to do this trade, okay? So instead of just being able to trade with people who are running arbitra uh, validators on Arbitrum, what we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to, to 
have anyone be willing to accept it. And the, the reason we're going to entice people to accept it is we're going to give them essentially an insurance contract that's going to cover the, uh, the not optimistic path of the rollup where that R block does not finalize. So we'll say, here's some ETH XX. You're going to get in seven days if this R block finalizes. And if it doesn't finalize, here's an insurance contract and it's going to pay out, you know, the same amount of ETH uh if it if it doesn't uh if the r block doesn't finalize okay so we set up that insurance as what's called a prediction market um i'm kind of low on time so I'll, I'll sort of gloss over the details a bit but prediction markets is something that we looked at a long time ago in 2014 and since then ethereum came out and then augur and gnosis came out and and there's a bunch of people that that are, are implementing these things there's one called poly market that you can use today um and uh, basically, you set up a contract where people put money in and you set up the event. The event can be adjudicated by by Ethereum. So Ethereum knows whether an R block succeeds or fails because it's being recorded in a contract that's already on layer one. So it's not like you're betting on who's going to become president and then you have to figure out how am I going to feed that information of who became president into a blockchain, right? There's no oracles or anything like that. It's just, it's all internal. Um, and you set it up kind of like a betting market. Uh, yeah, I won't go through the mechanics of, of, of how it works. Okay. Uh, the other thing we look at is how much should you pay uh, for, for ETH XX? So is 10 ETH L1 that's not locked up should be worth a little bit more than 10 ETH XX, okay? And so for this, what we do is we lean on economics and uh, or finance specifically and one subtopic that's discussed in finance is these, this idea of futures. Uh, so futures are where you buy, let's say you're a farmer and you want to sell your corn in six months, but you want to lock in the price today. Uh, or conversely, you're a factory, you need oil, but you don't need it for six months, but you want to lock the price in today. Then what you do is you enter into this future contract. And futures contracts, uh, there's a bunch of math equations that sort of dictate how you set prices. Uh, for this kind of thing. And so our insight was that this is kind of like a futures contract where you're getting ETH in seven days. And so you can use the same math to try and figure out how much you should pay for that ETH today, knowing that you're only going to get it in seven days. Okay. And so the, the sort of parameters that, that impact the price are how much will that ETH be worth? How much is it worth today? That's going to dictate how much closely, how much it's worth in seven days. Um, how long do you have to wait? So waiting a minute and waiting seven days are going to be different. Uh, how much does it cost to store the ETH today versus storing uh, the, the, the claim to get ETH? That's irrelevant because it all costs the same. Very different when you're talking about corn and oil, like oil futures prices can actually go negative because the storage costs is, is crazy um, and you need infrastructure to store things. Um, and then you can think about how much uh, you're going to earn on the ETH that you're locking up because you're not going to be able to earn it anymore because it's going to be locked up. Uh, you can think of exchange rate risks. They don't really apply if you're trading ETH for ETH, but if you're trading an ERC-20 token for ETH, it could. Um, you can think about how much do I have to pay to get my ETH back? So I have to go back to the outbox and, and get withdraw it and, and all of those kinds of things. Um, and then the last thing is you can think about uh, the, the, the probability that the optimistic path doesn't, we don't follow it um, and it doesn't finalize. So there's some risk associated with it. Okay. So some literal back of the envelope math uh, is in the paper, uh, but basically the, the numbers say that if you say wanted to withdraw hundred ETH, uh, someone should, a fair price for it based on some assumptions would be about 99.6 ETH. Uh, this equation is dominated actually by the gas cost of settling everything. And so if you try and do a smaller withdrawal, let's say you only withdraw half an ETH, then you actually have to pay, you're not going to get, you're going to get way less for it. You're going to get, um, sorry, that, that's, that's a typo. Uh, it should be 0 0.4, uh, ETH, uh, for, for 0 0.5 ETH. But, um, anyway, so the, the, the discount on it is going to be substantial. It would be more like 20% or something like that, that you would lose, uh, on that particular transaction. 
Okay, finally, uh, we implemented all of this. Uh, so we implemented it on Arbitrum itself. Uh, so the, we took their bridge and their outbox, uh, uh, Nitro, all the co source code for all the implementation changes we made is, is, is public. Uh, it's on GitHub. Uh, you can find the link in the paper. Or you can find the link uh, on the slide. Um, there's a whole bunch of engineering details that, that Massa or someone else could tell you about uh, if you have questions about it. Um, okay, so in summary, uh, what we do is we introduce this idea that you can withdraw these tokens and then when they're in that pending state, you can start trading them. Uh, and you're gonna also use a prediction market to provide insurance. And so the person receiving it could be a dumb smart contract. They don't have to know what Arbitrum is or anything like that. They don't have to follow the state of it. They just take the tokens, they take the insurance contract and they're satisfied that they're gonna get paid one way or the other. Uh, and then we look at the pricing of it, and then we look at the actual implementation uh, of it. And all of it is very feasible, uh, and it's something that, that could actually work in real life. Okay, so uh, we have maybe uh, five minutes or so for questions. Hi, Jeremy, I have a question. Yep. So... It's sort of interesting, the system as you describe it, I'm immediately reminded of payday loans in real life. Uh, that is off chain. Right. And I guess, I guess one concern, I have to wonder, do you have any concerns that in the distant future, or even in the near future, you can see systems like this emerge where basically there's like a predatory transaction happening for people to get their money while it's sitting, you know, in a, on a bridge somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So mechanically speaking, it is exactly a payday loan. Like, these places are willing to give you an advance uh, because they trust the company that is going to issue your paycheck, right? Um, the predatory nature of payday loans is uh, it, it, it's, I think it's, it, it comes from the context in which these stores operate as opposed to the mechanics of the finance itself. So I don't see this becoming like a payday loan, like predatory lending uh, kind of solution. So payday loans tend to exist in like poorer areas, uh, mainly because I, I guess that banks are intimidating uh, and uh, a lot of people are unbanked as well. And so they really have no choice uh, but, but to use uh, these types of things rather than using traditional finance. The whole idea of Ethereum and DeFi, the, a, the vision, I don't know if I buy it, but the vision is actually that it's open to anyone. It's permissionless. Anyone can use it. You can be unbanked. It doesn't, it doesn't care who you are or anything like that. Um, but then uh, obviously you have to have some level of technical sophistication in order to use it. And so that ends up being a, a kind of factor that, that locks people out as well. So uh, it, it, Maybe it's better or not better than the banking system, but anyways, I, yeah, so you're, you're right that mechanically it is a payday loan, but the predatory nature is not there and I don't see it uh, uh, emerging. Okay, it's a very cool solution, thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks. And if, if you're interested in those payday loans, there's a podcast, I think it's called 99% Invisible, and they have a really awesome episode. It's only like five or 10 minutes long on on why payday loan things exist. And I, I learned a lot from that episode. If students want to get into blockchain technology more, what recommendations would you have for them? Yeah, so it's a, a good question. Um, so actually I'll, I'll use Massa who's on the call, who's the, the lead author on this paper as a, as a good example. Um, so in her case, she had some research. We, we already decided that we we're using blockchain for it. So it was already in the blockchain sphere. Uh, we were trying to do something implementing order books. It was basically the, the, the roadblock was it was too slow on Ethereum. Okay. So we started looking at, well, what are some alternatives to it? I read the Usenix security paper about Arbitrum. And so I thought, you know, maybe Arbitrum is, is a good solution. So, so she started investigating it. And then her path, like to, to getting involved and, and ultimately getting a job uh, with Arbitrum was just, you know, being an early user of the system, hanging out on Discord, asking the questions, you know, people knew who she was, the paper eventually came out and things like that. So I think one really nice way to, to get involved is that a lot of these 
companies anyway, if you want to be more on the commercial side, a lot of the startups, they have these discord channels where the developers are, you know, people are there to help you and things like that. And just, you know, roll up your sleeves and, and, and just get involved. And a lot of this is open source technology and, and there's GitHub repositories and things like that. And so you can integrate yourself into the team that's actually building these things with zero expectations. Uh, but then if they end up needing to hire someone, they're, they're, they would rather hire the person that, that was, you know, hanging out with them for the last year, you know, asking lots of questions and they, they know rather than, than some stranger that they don't know. Are there any more questions? Well, if not, um, I'd like to thank our speaker. Uh, very interesting talk. Our next CDL presentation will be on Friday, September 29th. Um, Ennis Goloszewski, who asked the first question, will present um, uh, our work on formal methods analysis of the SBP protocol. And also, um, a couple of days ago, Josh Benelow from Microsoft uh, agreed to speak on uh, Microsoft's election guard um, sometime shortly uh, following Ennis's presentation, maybe on October 6th. Okay, so in, until the next meeting, um, thank you, and um, I'll see you then. Thanks, everyone.